In an ever-changing world, Conscious Co-Creation Productions presents a voice of truth and inspiration, resonating a vibration of love and understanding, illuminating new paths for new directions as we, as one, strive for higher and higher planes of existence, always remembering life changes. This is radio like you have never felt before. Life changes with Filippo. And now, your host, Filippo Voltaggio. Ciao, everyone. Thank you, John, for that live introduction. Sounded great. I love it. Uh, it is an ever-changing world. And uh, I said last week that I wasn't going to be doing this every week, and I don't think I am. I'm not going to be reading uh, mail every week. Uh, at least uh, I don't think I am. But um, I, I get the most incredible emails, and it's all because we have started this conversation. Uh, people are wanting to talk about this, obviously, more and more. And I, I, I'm so happy that we're here to serve, to have these conversations more and more. I, I give you an example. Somebody who I hardly ever communicate with, but is on my email list because of business, uh, wrote, um, uh, Filippo, yes, we're all in that process, some more, some less, at any given time. I know you have gone through a few metamorphoses of your own, as I have. Change in the service of getting closer to who you are and what you were meant to do in life is the trick, of course. Change for change's sake is not. Sometimes, though, we don't seem to have a choice and external circumstances voice change upon us. Uh, we'll talk about that. This sounds interesting. Good luck with the program. I, I, I just think that was amazing coming from her, um, who we've never talked about this kind of thing before. Somebody else. Hello, Filippo. Good to hear from you. This sounds like a very interesting and exciting project. I'm finally singing jazz standards at a local restaurant. However, my true love is comedy, and I am just starting to do open mic nights. I remember years ago you mentioned to me, look beyond singing and try to see myself as an entertainer. I was too sensitive as a singer to take that advice at the time. Good luck with your project. Well, that reminded me, how many times are we given the answers from our friends or from people that care about us and, and we can't see it or we refuse to because we are stuck and we don't want to change. And here, uh, this person... Uh, Gosh, it must have been at least three or four years ago that I suggested that, and now he's saying he's finally taking that into consideration and, and bringing his life towards that direction and his art. Um, and, you know, I wonder what it would have been like if he could have heard me at the time. I wonder what it would have been like if I could have heard beautiful people that have suggested certain things to me over the years at the time that I heard them. But I have made a commitment to change, and I am willing and able to make the changes uh, quickly, beautifully, uh, as, as need be. And uh, so that's part of what our show is all about. You know, our, our guest uh, tonight is a, is a very special man who's got a great message. And knowing he was going to be on the program uh, made me think about different things that have been happening in my life and how they might relate to this future society uh, that uh, he's going to be talking about. And so I had a couple situations happen in my life that made me think, I wonder if this is some of what Michael will be talking about, if this is like what the future could be like. And I couldn't formulate it exactly in my mind, so I'm hoping he could help me figure it out. I'll give you an example. I had the privilege and honor and joy of spending an afternoon with two beautiful little angels, my godchildren and nieces, uh, five-year-old and seven-year-old. And the, I, for some reason, I decided I was going to teach them how to play chess. Uh, I thought they might be a little young for that, but nevertheless, I sat them down and we started to play chess. And I started to teach them what all the pieces did and all this good stuff. And they really took to it. They were really good, too. They, they, I would joke around with them just to see if they had learned. And I'd say, and this one moves like this. And they'd say, no, it moves like this. And then they'd tell me the name of it. I'd call it a horsey. And they'd say, it's a knight. Um, or I'd, you know, it, it's just, it's a beautiful thing. And I have so much fun. 
But right in the middle of the game, it came to the situation where the younger of the two had an opportunity to eat. I, I called it eat instead of kill or maim or take over, whatever it is. I don't know. I said I eat for lack of a, a, a gentler way of, of, of saying it. So I said, you have the opportunity to eat either the pawn or the bishop of her opponent, quote unquote, her older sister. And she thought for a while, and I said, so which one do you want to eat? And she turned to her older sister and said, which one do you not mind me eating? And I just stopped in my tracks. I, I didn't know what to say. Uh, it was one of the most beautiful things I had ever heard because uh, she was playing a different game. I, I actually spoke to Michael about this, and, and, and he'll, I'm sure, address it a little later. She was playing a different game. I mean, if, if it truly is about having fun, um, then, then that, that, I, I, I'm still baffled by it. And, and it reminds me of the story that I either heard or read or both about uh, Special Olympics a, a few years back where the athletes... Of, uh, of a race after they heard the starting gun uh, started running and all of these handicapped uh, young adults and adults and children were running uh, as fast as they could to win and then one of them tripped and fell one of the opponents one of the people uh, that they were uh, running against and they were trying to beat tripped and fell and they all stopped running and came to help the one who had fallen. And when I read that story years back, I, I, I literally got a tear or two in my eye. Uh, it, it was very special. And then almost the same thing started to happen when I uh, heard my niece say that. And so it, it's for that reason that... Um, I'm really happy to have uh, Michael Pattinson on the show because I, I, I think he can also shed some light on what they know that we haven't learned yet, uh, whether it be in, in games or business or, or relationships. What, what, is our, what, what could be potentially our future there? So uh, let me tell you a little bit about Michael. He was born in England and uh, the United Kingdom. I, I, I don't know that I'll need to tell you that after you hear his wonderful speaking voice. Uh, he, he actually started ever since he was a child as a painter and quickly uh, was discovered as a fine arts painter and went on to the university and, and there he studied uh, not only the arts but music, which of course are the arts. Uh, and while he was studying music, Something interesting started to happen to him where he started to be able to see the music. Uh, and so he uh, started to paint what he saw. And so he started painting in the musicalist style. And uh, before long, uh, he became the music painter. Uh, very well known throughout uh, the world, actually. He, his art was shown in over 40 cities in Europe and Mexico and the U.S., and all over, and he had painted over 300 of these original musicalist artworks. Um, and uh, th they sold all over the world and, and did very well for him. He, he went on to live in England and Paris and Monaco, Mexico, San Francisco and Florida, and now he's in California. And he uh, has no longer is no longer really painting like he used to because he has received other gifts. And it's those gifts that we are going to be talking more of tonight. But one of them was the gift, perhaps much like he did with the art, uh, the gift of seeing our future and, and the gift of seeing um, energy in, in, in the form of art in his mind somehow. So we'll talk to him more about that. Please welcome to the show, Michael Pattinson. Thank you very much. For the <laughs> it's great to be here. It's great to have you here. Uh, there's so much I, I want to ask you, and before we go, get into talking about our future, what was it that you saw? What was it that you were experiencing while in, in, in music school, in art school? Um, basically, I was listening to the music, and uh, 
I was not drunk or on drugs or anything like that at the time, but I suddenly started to see the music, like literally each shape for each note. I thought, what on earth is that? So I put the music back on again that I was listening to, and I thought, I wonder if I could do that again. I put the same piece of music on, and surely enough, I saw the same thing again, note by note for the music, but it was better the second time through. Colors and everything. Colors, shapes, everything. And the next day, I wasn't even painting at the time. This was back in 1971, up in Scotland. And the next day, I just went out and bought paints, and I did my first painting. Wow. Do you remember the piece by any chance? Oh, yes. It's the first one on my website. It's Rachmaninoff. Uh, Sviatoslav Richter plays Rachmaninoff's second piano concerto. Wow. And so all it was is a piano? It was a piano plus an orchestra, a little bit of representation of oh, an orchestra. Okay. And so you didn't paint an orchestra. I mean, I've seen your work. It's mm -hmm. amazing. So, right. But for the audience, you didn't paint an orchestra. You painted, I don't know how to describe How do you describe it? Well, I painted shapes where the orchestra was. And in relation, the piano was certainly there, and so was the pianist. Um, but the orchestra was represented by forms and colors surrounding the piano. Like as if you could just see the concerto rather than the players. <laughs> it was very interesting. I thought, my goodness, what am I on? <laughs> <laughs> but you accepted it. Yes, I've accepted it. I, and then after that, through the decades that followed, I have um, trained myself, sometimes quite rigorously, to literally translate music into colors and forms in the mind's eye, or what somebody, some people would call the, the, uh, the third eye, the spiritual perception, mm -hmm. that, that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. And it's, it's gotten to the point where when I want to, I can really see music very, very well, like a, a, an animation. Wow. Except it's the mag most magnificent thing you can ever um, imagine. I, I surmise from my experience that sound is almost like the only thing we have left of music. Uh, explain that? And it used to be, music, I think, used to be, a long, long time ago, in the world of spirit, um, more visual and emotional than just sound. Mm. Now the sound reminds us of those times and those beautiful, magnificent things, those creations. It's like almost like God's playtime. Wow. So, so you're saying there was a time when humans might have been able to experience music in a more full body experience, like colors and body sensations and, and sound as well. But now right. it's just sound. Right, but the, the, uh, I would correct only one point about that, which, which is basically, I think, it's a time before humans. Oh. When we were just spirit. Oh. And up in space and in beautiful spaces and wonderful places. Oh, okay. But that's just my opinion. All right. Well, your opinion matters a lot, so, and I'm looking forward to hearing more of it. So um, I have to ask you, is it difficult or... Uh, is it difficult for you to hear so much music? Because nowadays, everywhere you go, there is music. Is it difficult for you? Uh, are you always seeing things? Does it bother you, or do you enjoy it? Um, it doesn't bother me, no, because it really is a conscious creation. And unless I'm consciously creating it, it's not happening. Ah. Uh, which is a wonderful gift. If it was happening all the time, I think I'd go crazy. So you could turn it on or turn it off? Yes. It's a basically it's not an automatic process. It's a conscious creation, instantaneous creation. Okay. And have you ever tried uh, to listen to, I'm not picking on any type of music, but music that you don't necessarily enjoy listening at your leisure? Yes, I've listened to quite a bit of it. Sometimes I have no choice. Right. Have you, no, uh, no, not have you tried listening to it, but have you tried to go to that place and see what it looks like? Uh, sometimes, but I have not honestly put much uh, effort into that because I really only really do the things that I love. Uh, I have to feel an emotional connection with the music. Otherwise, it's kind of like a little bit of a clinical uh, experiment. Mm. And it doesn't really come out too well. Ah, well, that, that makes sense. Mm -hmm. I was just wondering if it would look, if the colors would be dark or... I don't know what they would look like. Okay. <laughs> well, <laughs> I had to ask. <laughs> You're good. Um, so, now... It's, it's interesting to me, being an artist and knowing many artists, I, I, I know, I, I obviously don't see like you do, or paint like you do, but uh, I know what it means to go into a space and have something come to you. Uh, so when you're saying that something has come to you about our future, I, I get it. Mm -hmm. I, I, so is it from that same place for you? It almost is from the same place because it uses the, the spiritual perceptions, not the physical eyes, mm -hmm. um, almost not the phys physical mind. It's basically a spiritual type of experience. And what I, what I would say I have um, with regard to the future and life changes would be a vision, 
a very broad and very simple but very inspiring vision. Okay. That's what I would say. I have. And you're having a vision as far as it's, it's complete or like you actually see people and things happening or you have a feeling about it? Well, that's a very good question. What happened, I remember it happened back in 1982. Um, I happened to be meditating one day and suddenly I, above my head there was this like brilliant dazzling light. No heat, just light, like spiritual type of inspiration. Mm -hmm. As if the sun was above my head, but there was no heat coming from it. It was basically like an inspiration. Now, this is in your mind's eye? Yes, or in my mind's You eye. had your eyes closed? Yes. Okay. Yes, I did. Now, if I'd seen it with my eyes open, that would have been a different matter. <laughs> <laughs> but basically, <clears throat> excuse me, the <clears throat> concept that came through was an ideal culture. How an ideal culture would look if it, would <clears throat> if it bore fruit, if it came to fruition. And it was a very giant concept, rather like getting a whole download of an entire cyclopedia, but just at a glance. And I thought, my goodness, that's absolutely magnificent. It's actually never left. It's actually been there ever since. Hmm. But what happened was the most fascinating thing afterwards. I've I don't know if anybody else has had this experience. Maybe they have. But the vision was too large to, to comprehend in one stroke. Hmm. And so what would happen at random times of the day or night a little piece of the puzzle would just like fall through, which would just like a little piece of the puzzle would just come through as a little saying or a little sentence to be expanded upon later. Mm. And I used to write them down religiously every time they came through. And I have thousands and thousands of these little puzzle pieces now, which are ready to be written up into a general, large, broad vision of a future, which could be really quite magnificent. And uh, it all is based upon inspiration and on divine love. And the fact that we're all in this together, we, that's one of the main things, is that humanity should work with humanity. We're all players on the same team of life. Competition and warfare is not the way to go. Okay, actually, I, I, I'd like to get to that. But I have to say that when you say love and, and you know, what you were saying before, it just gave me the impression of, you know, the 60s. Now, of course, I wasn't around, but I've seen pictures and I've seen movies. So uh, is that what you're talking about? I'm talking about an attitude or a, uh, a guiding principle of love rather than a guiding principle of competition or of survival or of dominate, domination. You see what I mean? It's like we're all in this together. Mm -hmm. It's the kind of love that, uh, that God would make, that kind of a thing. It's like a really a general wonderful, magnificent thing. Okay, so then earlier you and I were talking about my nieces and the chess situation. Mm -hmm. And you had some amazing insights on it that I, I hadn't gone there yet. So here, here the little one is asking the older one, uh, which one do you not mind me eating? Mm -hmm. And so you said she's playing a whole other game. You're saying she's yeah. playing a bigger game. Yeah, she's playing a bigger game. A bigger it? game than chess. Yeah, what a wonderful thing she said. That, that just shows what a wonderful personality that little girl has. Because she's still playing the girl of sister loves sister, which is a much bigger game than just a game of chess. Mm. And so she's still playing that as a senior game. She has not lost touch with who she really is, even though she's playing another game too. Mm. So I think it's fabulous. What a wonderful little girl. Wow, she has not lost touch with who she is, even though she's playing another game too. Right, exactly. And it's, uh, another illustration of that is like, I hear sometimes, um, just in general life, well, you know, why did you do that? Why did you cheat this person? Why did, why did you do something against this person in this business deal, for example? And I say, well, business is business. I've heard this so many times, you know. Right. Business is business. Well, okay. If business is business, then you have no right to any more oxygen or gravity or water or anything because these are all part of life. If you're, if you're saying that business is uh, divorced from life, then you have no claim to use any of these resources whatsoever. Hmm. But business is not business. Business is part of life. And if you're part of life, you should respect your competitor, respect your client. All that kind of thing. It's rather like the Merchant of Venice. Remember Portia and the Merchant of Venice? Mm -hmm. um, where she says, okay, well, you can have the pound of flesh. Right. But don't you dare spill a drop of a blood. A drop of blood, right. <laughs> <laughs> you see what I mean? And business is not business. Business is part of life, and life should be respected. And business should include that kind of respect. Okay, so just to understand here. So, okay, business is business. And if we're doing business, and you have a competitor... 
because uh, John Snow, one of our producers, was in on this conversation too, and he says, you know, you could help your competitor because you're all in the same game. So help me with that one. Well, what would be the exact question there? <laughs> I don't know the exact See, question. That's, that's the point. That's, what I was <laughs> that's the point. <laughs> Maybe if I knew the question, I might know the answer, too. Right, exactly. Uh, <laughs> okay, so should I help Mike? You're, you're saying business is not business because you're still living, and yeah. you're still part of life, right. and so your competitor is part of life. Right. And, and John was saying, well, then you should help your competitor. Right. And so uh, then how do you compete? How do you do business? Well, basically, the current um, paradigm for business is making a profit. Right? Right. They say this is the bottom line. Um, I would say the profit is not the bottom line in, in, in business or economics. The true bottom line for any transaction or business venture is cultural impact. Mm. That's the true bottom line. You, the profit would be a subtotal towards the grand total of cultural impact. And so if you take into account cultural impact, when you're manufacturing, when you're distributing, when you're selling, all this kind of thing, then you are really all on the same track and everybody wins. But when it's competition of profit versus profit, profit versus loss, it's a lose-lose situation. Hmm. See what I mean? It's, it's a greater image, a greater vision than just the, the limited vision we have now. I mean, I did a, a master's degree in economics back in 1972. That's when I started uh, the music thing as well. And so I understand some principles of the economics despite my degree. <laughs> I'm sure you do. <laughs> well, this is interesting that you say that. Like I've said before, I, I get to meet some of the most fascinating people and some, some beautiful, I, I get to hear some beautiful concepts and stories. And just the other day, I was meeting with a friend who is a, a manufacturer of some amazing clothes and, and some conscious clothes at that. And yet she said, it's hard to produce because I don't want to produce just to produce. And yet, as, even though I want my business to grow, I don't want people to be buying clothes just to buy clothes. And, and she says, we're using up our resources. Mm -hmm. And I said to her, we need to have a conversation because I'd like to know, how does one resolve that? Right. It sounds to me like she's getting very, very close to a major realization, uh, to a major uh, turning point in her life. It's kind of like the buds are starting to open for her on something which is going to change her life completely. Right. It sounds like she's on a wonderful path. Oh, I'm sure she is. So what the path that she's on, I have a feeling, is the path that you are alluding to. So this mm -hmm. society that you talk about, and, and you say, by the way, it's not utopian. Please talk no, about that. It's not utopian because basically if you look up utopia, you'll find a derivation of the words that means no place. Mm. Okay, so we're not going no place. We're going someplace. Mm. All right, so we're doing the anti-utopia thing. We're doing the realism, right? And what I'm talking about is a vision of an inspired culture, a culture which has a basis of inspiration, of the respect of life, the respect of one's fellow man, um, the respect of one's uh, fellow's feelings, and one's fellow's you know, well-being. Basically, it's all, we're all in this together. So let's play on the same team. They mm. say, well, where's the opposition? Where's the fun going to be in that? Well, there's plenty of that anyway. It comes up as a natural course. There's always opposition uh, to what we want to do. But the basic principle is that's what, that's what I'm looking at, and it's a change of focus. It's a change of focus from profit, destruction, um, raping the world, you know, the, the world's resources, and turning that around and having a completely different focus. Mm. You know, I, I'm looking at something that you wrote uh, on your website, actually. You said, this is designed to be a team effort where all play together using our multiple talents to further the cause. Uh, that's, I mean, you, you say it so eloquently there, and then you go on to say, um, it, was, uh, it was also clear, you were talking about the information you've received, mm -hmm. uh, that if we are successful... It could take us from the information age to the inspiration age. I love that. Thank you. Uh, our past or possibly incoming uh, dark ages would be made to yield to the light ages. Mm -hmm. I mean, this is brilliant. We are in a new millennium after all. So you have formed Star Tree Creative, and you say the purpose of it is to facilitate and enjoin 
uh, cooperation of humans who desire it in the creation of a new and inspiring culture which gives honor and sustenance to all who I am. Help me with that. Yes. Well, the word I am there is a specific usage, which means all there is, or God, or divine, or the creator. It's basically all of life itself. Okay. And you can say that, you know, if you wanted to give God a name, theoretically, you could say that its name is I am. Okay. You see? So everything that God has created needs to be honored and ha- needs to have sustenance. Mm. You see what I mean? So when we, when we change our focus over into... Um, creative endeavors and supporting creative people, which is what I want to do, then we get abundance. And that abundance can be shared quite freely with everybody, mm. with all who I am and you are and you are. You see what I mean? Mm. And that's, that's the whole thing. Right now we're all in competition. We're all pulling on a blanket. We're all trying to get this and get that to the detriment of others. We need to shift this direction around. It's like the New Age movement, movement is now coming of age. Mm. Interesting. And, and you're saying that one of the biggest pieces is to honor the creatives. Oh, yes. Now, is it just the, well, please explain the creatives, mm-hmm. and then is it just the creatives, or is it the creative in all of us? Well, let me put it in context. Um, right now, 2009, we've got a major economic crisis which if you haven't heard about, you must be living under a rock. <laughs> right? Okay, this has been brought about by some false principles uh, in the living of life and also in economics. You see what I mean? Yes. Um, we have not been concentrating on one of the major um, aspects of human resources, which is human talent, human creativity. I would say that human talent and creativity is the least used but most valuable natural resource on the planet. Mm. It's more than oil, more than coal, more than diamonds, more than anything like that. Human talent needs to be treated as a valuable resource and for creative people to be helped, to be supported, to be funded, to be protected in everything they do so that they produce the magnificence that God intended them to do. Everyone has their natural talents. I don't believe these people who say, I have no talent. Mm. I don't believe it. I just think they haven't found it yet. So you're saying we need to support the creatives, but also the creative in, in each one of us needs to come out. Yes, exactly. And, and in so doing... Uh, this changes the whole focus and changes our society. It would do, because right now we're fo- focusing on something completely different. So tell us where we are now and how we can move into where we're going. Okay, right now we're focusing on the things that tear us apart. We're mm. focusing on competition. We're focusing, focusing on profit. Uh, we're fo- focusing on a bad ecology, this kind of thing. <laughs> Terrible politics. Uh, that's just one thing in the mix. You see what I mean? Mm-hmm. But if we sh- shift our focus to really getting down to the individual person, each individual person has God-given talents in some way. It could be very different between people. Each person is so incredibly different. But if each person wakes up to their own natural talent, then the divine scheme of things starts to come into play. Mm. Because that's how it was intended in the first place. Mm. That's why those talents are seeded in there. That's why they're living in there. You see what I mean? We need to bring them out. Not make creative people into slaves. That would be the opposite direction we want to do. Okay. There's always, if there's some givers, there's always some takers. And it looks like a perfect match until it blows up. Mm. You see what I mean? But we need to, to nurture, to care for, to protect, to fund a lot of creative people and then we'll get a whole different focus. Mm. You see what I mean? And then the, the, the destructive efforts will become less attractive, such as going to war, such as having war machines, this will become simply less attractive, even, even to the war manufacturers. Hmm. Even to the war manufacturers. Yes, there's more profit to be made in human resources and talent than there is in any war. Wow. That's, that's a big statement. It is, but it's, it's, it's a true statement, because it goes on forever. Wars have to be created just to keep the army going or give them something to do, whereas creative thing is, it's infinite. It has no end. We can make this, we can make this culture on this planet, the human culture, into a work of art. Hmm. And then, my idea about that, the vision, part of this vision, which is really important, I would say probably one of the most, most important points. Um, and how can I put this? It's a little difficult to, to put into words. Um, well, if you can't put it into words, I, know, I can't no, help you. I, <laughs> <laughs> that's fine. Um, it's really like the, the broader view. People are say, well, 
if you want an inspired society, where is inspiration going to come from for all of this? Where does inspiration come from? I mean, I, I don't get inspired very much or something like that because of ordinary life. Mm. I tell you, inspiration comes from a connection with your own higher self through spirituality, through meditation, through things like that, and also from looking at the biggest picture you can envisage. Okay. The biggest picture. Envisage not just your little problems of paying rent or of buying groceries, but envisage your whole community doing better mm. or your whole nation doing better and how would it be and how would it look and suddenly, pow, inspiration will come through because the biggest picture of all is the biggest inspiration of all. Mm. And what we do is what, and we do it to our detriment is we focus on the tiny little things which are extremely uninspiring. Mm. See what I mean? So we're not inspired after that. We focus on the tiny things yeah, we're not inspired. and we're not inspired. No, we're not. So we can't solve the bigger problems nor can we solve the the small problems because we're not inspired. Exactly. So you're saying focus on the big problem mm -hmm. and then we're inspired enough to uh, even solve the small ones. Yes, because it's included within the larger one and it will be easier. <laughs> it will be easier. I to, love this. Because you'll get cooperation. You know? Cooperation from other people who are thinking along the same way. Yes, exactly. It's like you're on the same team together. So, okay, well, I can help you with this or you can help me with that. Whereas, if it's me, I just need to do this little tiny thing here, who, who else is interested? Mm. You see what I mean? Right. So it begs the question, uh, sure, I could do that, but the person down the street's not going to do that, or my competitor's not going to do that, mm -hmm. so I, I'll lose if I do it and nobody else does. Well, you can't possibly lose anyway, because you'll be happy doing it. And happiness, you know, your joy will be your biggest treasure. Okay. And that, that will be the biggest treasure. It's far more a, a treasure than objects and uh, possessions. And so, inner joy counts for a lot, as you know, Philip. <laughs> uh, yeah, I, I know, but I'm trying to... <laughs> thank you, Michael. I'm not trying to correct you. <laughs> <laughs> no, I appreciate you knowing that about me, and I know you know. But I, what I'm getting at is how do we, how do we expand upon this? Uh, you know, I, I know it feels good. Now, how do you convince somebody that it feels good? They'd have to be inspired, and they'd have to think about that big picture until they got some inspiration, and then they should act on that inspiration. And then they'd see how it felt. They'd have to experience it for themselves. It's, it's a grassroots type of a thing of one person at a time. And actually, I do know that you help people do that. Uh, and before we get into that, th this reminds me of uh, an analogy I used once where I said, it, it, if, I, if I had a friend that was throwing a party or getting married or something, and, mm -hmm. and I arrive at, at the reception and, and such and such isn't done yet, or I, I came thinking I was going to hang the banner or something, but the banner's already hung, do I sit there and say, no, you've got to hang my banner because it's better, or I would have hung it better and, and brood about it, or do I say, well, what else needs to get done? The rest of the guests will be here in an hour, mm -hmm. and do I help out? Because we have a common cause, mm -hmm. which is we've got to have a great party. Right. So wherever my talents are best served, and at that moment, if it's unfolding chairs, then I'll unfold chairs. Yes, exactly. Right. It's a cooperative effort. It's, a, it's you're all in the game. You're all playing the same game towards the same inspiring result. So it goes back to your point that you were saying earlier that we, we could see that if it's a, a wedding or a party and it's our friends, but when we go to work the next day, now we're in competition and we're trying to screw the other guy. Mm -hmm. Temporarily, but uh, even that can be changed too. Because I tell you, if, if businesses took the, also the, the larger picture and they included their cultural impact worldwide, they would actually start feeling better about going to work. Mm. And they would start feeling better. They'd probably be rewriting some mission statements from corporations. But my goodness, people would love to come to work because they're going for a higher goal. You see what I mean? It's very inspiring to have a high goal. And when you don't have one, you're kind of like sitting in the mud wondering what to do. You know, I'm, I'm, you're, you're reminding me of, what is it, the miracle on something street, with 42nd, San, 42nd street. street with Santa Claus, uh, where he was being Santa Claus. That's right. And the store did better, and so did the competing store. Yeah. And then the other store wanted to do the same thing they were doing. That's right. And that's what you're saying. Yes. Well, maybe we should just all watch the movie then. And learn from it. At least. <laughs> At least. It's a start. And actually, so, um, 
there are steps and uh, to take. And obviously, seeing somebody like you on a one-on-one -on -one level uh, could help inspire us. So tell us, because this is interesting about you and your visions. You had the visions about the, the paintings mm -hmm. being music, or music being painting. Right. And then you had uh, visions about our society being a certain way. Yes. And now you actually have visions about people when they come see you one-on-one? -on -one? That's right. Um, what happened was a really strange thing in the, the same... Um, perception ability that I use to see music mm -hmm. is basically seeing with the mind's eye and you're seeing energies and I was seeing them in great detail and in great precision but what I didn't expect was that when I was sitting down in a session with somebody in order to help them through uh, blockages on creativity or on emotions or whatever it is is that when they were talking to me in a session I could see literally see the energies that were blocking them hmm. not imagining it's not intuitive it's perceptive I, literally I can see them like you see where they are or what they are? Or it's funny. It's a very strange thing. I can literally see them as, as solid pieces uh, here and there. Mm -hmm. I can see where they're connected to. And when I put my attention on them, plus the person concerned is also talking about them, so they have their attention on them. Right. These things actually give out the information quite freely. Wow. <laughs> and it's really quite a remarkable thing. I've done thousands and thousands of hours of this. And I've actually started, I've actually put up a website now which people could go to. Uh, which is creativemastery.net. I didn't know about this. It's put up today. Oh, okay. <laughs> in, 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 honor, in honor of this program. Wow, how exciting. Creativemastery.net is born right. today That's in right. honor of this program. And right. it's .net for internet, not .com for commercial. So it's, it's creativemastery.net. It's a very tiny site for the moment, but at least it's there. We're going to be fleshing it out in the next, next few weeks. That is really exciting. Mm -hmm. I can't wait to go to it after the show. Thank you. And, and so actually while we're at it, tell us about your other two sites. Uh, the other two sites, uh, one of them is the art site, which is M Pattinson, M P A T T I N S O N dot smugmug dot com. It's a very strange name, but it's a very beautiful photo site. M Smug M is yes, yeah, S M U G yeah. M U G. Yeah, smugmug dot com. <laughs> M Pattinson dot smugmug dot com. That's my art site. And then the other one is startreecreative dot com. And that's basically we just got a, uh, a, a blueprint of our plans. For the moment but this thing is happening now we've got the time this is the time to do this yes you know I, I remember when I met you uh, actually thanks to another one of our producers Mark uh, Lejour uh, a few months back or, or even longer now you were you had you had said that the time is now to bring this information out yes. and and what was it that because you've had this information for quite a while yes. what it wasn't time no um, there was a false boom in progress where people were not interested in, in listening to new ideas because people are doing so well in this fake boom. Mm. Now the bubble has burst and reality has set in. Okay, maybe they'll be willing to listen now, and I hope they are because it's going to be a really good game. Wow. What a, and what a game you're proposing. Yes. So now people come to you. Mm -hmm. uh, do you see this as a painting? I mean, because I'm thinking of the music now. Like somebody, somebody standing or sitting before you mm -hmm. and... You see their blockages. I do. Um, yes. Basically, it's really, really easy to do my sessions. Okay. Because life will hand me literally the next card off the deck for this person, the thing which they need to solve, and the way to solve it at the same time. And it's just literally like taking a card off the deck. Okay, this is the thing. I can see it. We resolve it. We take it apart. It never comes back. Because I don't deal in symptoms. I deal in causes. And it's very, very exciting. Wow. You should try it. I should try. <laughs> okay. Everybody should try it, but I don't have that much time. <laughs> <laughs> well, how do people get a hold of you so they can try it? Is it through the website? Yes, or? I put my contact info on um, creativemastery.net. Oh, okay. Oh, the one that was just born today? Yes. Creative, do you mind if I say mastery? I, yes, yes. <laughs> I'm afraid you're not British enough to say mastery. <laughs> I can say mastery, <laughs> oh. but I just want to make sure. <laughs> you're British. <laughs> Creativemastery.net. Net, dot net. Um, okay, so what if, if there's one thing that you see that's already formulated in the future that 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 we could get really excited about? Like uh, th the reason I'm asking this is because do we all have to be focused on the same uh, big uh, goal, big dream, or can we all have see the vision differently, but we all end up in the same place? Well, I'd say that the, 
the vision is uh, multiple because the people are multiple and the people will decide what they want to create but it should be something probably quite beautiful so it will inspire them and they'll be proud of the result so we're probably going to be going towards a more beautiful culture okay and treating our planet more beautifully and making our culture into a work of art Okay, you were saying actually, uh, when we've talked before, that that even the buildings will be works of art and beautiful and inspiring, etc. So yes, that's right. Okay, exactly. They will, they will, they will be, um, they will make the planet happy. Okay, so as long as we're focused on beauty, we might not have all the same picture in our mind, mm-hmm. but we're all connecting along the lines of wanting beauty. Absolutely, there shouldn't be any norms imposed upon what's beautiful and what's not because it's very subjective. But normally, if somebody is being inspired, believe me, other people are going to like it too. Well, 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 you know what? I'm inspired, and I believe you that other people are going to like this interview as well as I, I have so. been. Uh, this, is, this is very exciting. So, uh, one last thing, because on our way there, mm-hmm. you talk about inspiring the artists, mm-hmm. um, and that there are people that you know uh, that are uninspired with their lives, but it's because they don't have the creativity inside of them or they're not supporting creatives? Oh, I see what you mean. Right. Um, yes, I think that this is a really important point we can probably uh, take up right now. I, what I found is basically that there is a subject which has been omitted from life right now and it's causing a lot of the damage we're seeing in economics, politics, in the military thing, everything like that. The culture, the subject is culture. And that subject has been omitted. I've even been to the bookstores and said, could you send me to the uh, culture section? They said, mm. what? Mm. Oh, my goodness, that's something. So uh, what I've done, part of the vision which came through in the little puzzle pieces which were coming through is a definition of culture. And it's a brand new definition. And it, I'd say it's a golden key. Mm. It's as simple as the wheel. And you say, okay, a wheel is a, a disc with a hole in it with an axle you can put through. Mm. That's so simple. How could you possibly use that? Mm. Look at the billion uses for a wheel, right? Mm. Even donuts. Exactly. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> you got it. <laughs> so I'm sorry. I hope you didn't forget what you were going to try. No, no, no. <laughs> I do not. I do not forget. <laughs> okay. Right. You could always tune in again and visualize I, I it just, all over again. I, just, right? I was looking at your glazed look. <laughs> You didn't say that, my glazed look. Chocolate covered, I prefer. Uh, okay. But, okay. So, so anyway, um, and the culture should be in levity as well. Very good. <laughs> and we are in levity. And so the definition, which I came up with through this thing, is culture is what is put there and remains there by consent. Period. That's it. Hmm. It's what is put there. If it remains there, it's part of the culture. If it's taken away, it's not part of the culture. If it's not put there, it's not part of the culture. Mm. If you put something there and people agree, yes, that can stay, it's part of the culture. And that's every single object, every single person, everything on the planet. Wow. That one definition. But the point is, people can act with this. They can engage their own lives in their own personal culture with this. They say to themselves, what am I putting there? What am I putting there in my life? What's getting agreement? What's not getting agreement? That's particularly uh, relevant in families. Mm. I want to put this there. No, you're not going to put that there. So who gets the prevailing agreement? If you put it there hard enough and you put it there lovingly enough, you'll get agreement and you'll be creating part of your culture. And it can start from one person and go to a family, a group and everything. It's the same definition throughout. Culture is what is put there and remains there by consent. Wow. Culture is what is put there and remains there by consent. So that's part of being the change we wish to see in the world. We, mm-hmm. we decide what it is that we want our culture to have uh, mm-hmm. within ourselves, our family, our friends, and then that, that grows from there. That's right. So all, all question of putting something there first, normally which is inspired, something inspired, and then seeing that you can have it remain there by consent. Well, Michael, I am inspired, Thanks. and you shall remain in my life by consent. And, um, and in, our, in, in, in our Life Changes with Filippo uh, team, and, and hopefully... Uh, everybody listening to this show, uh, you, you've given us so much great information, and I can't wait to see what you see. Or Actually, I can't wait to see what I see, because mm-hmm. we're all headed in the same direction. That's right. It's all life changes. And it's all life changes. Yeah. Indeed it is. Michael Pattinson, thank you so much for being on the show thank with you, us. Man. Can't wait to have you it's again. My pleasure. Thank you. And you can learn more about Michael Pattinson on our website. We will have all three of his links 
on there so that you can um, go and enjoy his art, uh, have a session with him, and read about the society that we hopefully will all be able to take uh, to take part in very soon. In the meantime, we're going to take part in something uh, uh, else that's illuminating. And here is Stacy Hess with our illuminating, illuminating. Why do I keep doing that? Because you're so illuminating. You're so bright. I'm emanating. <laughs> you're, you're emanating luminary light. Uh, our luminary list with Stacy Hess. Hi, Stacy. <laughs> Hi, Filippo. That, it... that was a lovely introduction. <laughs> Thank you. I was still in the future. I'm having well, a good time. I'm going to reel you back. Yeah, okay. In fact, I'm going to reel you back about 98 years right now. 98 years? Yeah, 98 years. And, and I'm going to talk about something that, based on Michael's definition of culture, is probably culture. I'm going to talk a little bit about the Titanic. The Titanic. The, the one Titanic. that sank. The one that sank. The one that inspired the whole tip of the iceberg kind of conversation. Anyway, um, so the Titanic sank 98 years ago or so, and on that Titanic was a nine-week-old baby. And the nine-week-old baby is now um, 98 years old. Wow. And she lives in London, and she is in poor health. And her name is uh, Milvina. Wow. Yeah, and so the great thing of this story is that I'm sure you saw the movie Titanic. With I did. Leonardo DiCaprio and Kate Winslet. It was a James Cameron film. Uh-huh. So um, there's a photographer in London, and he took a photo of, uh, of Milvina signing a photograph, just her hands. And um, he started selling that to raise money to help pay her nursing home bills oh. because she couldn't afford her medical bills. So he was trying to raise about $30,000, which was what she needed for one year's worth of health care. And nursing care, actually. Mm -hmm. And um, he decided to just randomly pitch the idea to Leonardo, Leonardo Leo, because, you know, he and I are... <laughs> okay, Leo. We're close. Leo. Leo, if you're listening. Leo, if you're listening. I, I have a feeling you did something good here, so... Um, anyway, I met his so, dad, by the way. Really? Yeah, actually, nice, nice guy. Actually, very nice guy. Yeah. An artist. Really cool. Very cool. Yeah. So, so Leonardo DiCaprio and Kate Winsley reached out to, as well as James Cameron and a few other folks who aren't involved yet, but... Um, he asked them if they would match the money that he raised dollar for dollar. And hmm. Leonardo and Kate and James Cameron all said absolutely. Um, so to date, they've donated $30,000 to wow. help fund the nursing care for um, this lone survivor, the last living survivor of the Titanic. That's a beautiful story. Isn't that a great story? That I really is, love that story. That's a great story. It may be my favorite luminary story so far. <laughs> well, you bring such great ones, but that it just feels good. Doesn't it? It's yeah. really nice, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah. So it's, uh, yeah, that's luminary this week. Well, there are two of them, three of them. That's right. Yeah, I always sneak a couple extra <laughs> in there. And I think there are going to be more uh, as, this, as this story continues to break. Absolutely. So. Definitely. Well, thank you for bringing it well, here and thank you. sharing it for everybody. Of I course. don't get my hug this time. Well, all right. <laughs> <laughs> thank you, Stacey. Thank Stacey. you, Filippo. Well, that's, that's always fun and exciting. And, and, and now, uh, you know, I, actually, I could be reading email as well that, that, have said, that has said so many great things about Dorothy's State of the Universe address which has inspired and helped change people's lives. And so I am just uh, can't wait to see what you have to share with us today. Here's Dorothy Lee. Hi. Hi. What a great show. Thank you, Michael, for being here. So, to our audience, I've spoken often of living from the heart and not the head. And some of you have asked what this really means. Are you asked, how do we know if we're in our heads or in our hearts? The answer is very simple. If you are practicing the golden rule, that is, if you do unto others as you would have them do unto you, then you are living from your heart. When we treat one another with great love, respect, honor, and understanding, we get these very same things returned. The golden rule is the secret behind the secret. Those of us who truly live by this rule find that our lives are filled with love, peace, joy, abundance, and bliss. Our relationships are joyous and vibrationally high. Those who are unloving, 
rude, angry, jealous, and hateful to others, find their lives filled with lower vibrational relationships and all kinds of obstacles and problems. Did you know that the golden rule of the ethic of reciprocity is found in the scriptures of nearly every religion? It is often regarded as the most concise and general principle of ethics. I want to share with you some of the examples. In the Baha'i faith, in the epistle to the son of the wolf, it is stated this way, And if thine eyes be turned towards justice, choose thou for thy neighbor that which thou choosest for thyself. The Hindu faith says in the Mahabharata, This is the sum of duty. Do not to others which if done to thee would cause thee pain. In the Jewish Talmud, it is written, What is hateful to you, do not to your fellow man. That is the entire law. All the rest is commentary. The Zoroastrian faith says this, Whatever is disagreeable to yourself, do not do unto others. The Buddhists say it like this, Hurt not others with that which pains yourself. The Christian Bible states, All things whatsoever ye would do, that men should do to you, do ye even so to them, and this is the law. The Muslim faith tells us, No one of you is a believer until he desires for his brother that which he desires for himself. And as Socrates, Do not unto others what angers you have done to you by others. All of this is the same over and over again. It's so interesting to me that all of these faiths are essentially saying the very same thing, and yet there is so much war started in the name of religion. However, by choosing to focus less on what divides us and more on what unites us, we can more effectively build a brighter future for us and for Mother Earth. Therefore, I ask, Please let each of us choose to embrace this universal truth, this golden rule, and live it. By doing this, we can and will become the change we wish to see in the world. Every person in the world has a heart. Every heart has a place within that wants only to love and be loved. Let us connect with that place of love in our own hearts and in the hearts of those all around us. Let us take a moment each and every day to open to the heart connection we share with all people through love. Thank you for listening. Until next week, please choose to live from your hearts and to love yourself enough to make very conscious and elegant choices. And please know that you are loved, you are lovable, and you are loved. Mm, Thank you, Dorothy. You know, um, if there's anybody that lives by those words, it's you. And honestly, uh, having gotten to know you over these past couple years, I don't know how you do it. And I've seen you experience situations where uh, one would think you would react in a different way, and yet you react from love. What is... Your secret. I mean, you read to us what you read to us, but do you think of all of that when you're faced with a situation like that? I do now. However, (laughs) (laughs) before you met me, I lived from a place of reaction and fear, and I I did have a Ph.D. in victimhood, but no more. Okay, so, but now, where, where do you go when you when you're attacked or uh, attacked you verbally or, 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 you know, treated badly and uh, wh- where do you go to find the place to be? What I've learned is that the things that I judged in the past to be awful and horrible have turned out to be the greatest gifts that I could ever imagine. And so now when something that I would have previously judged to be horrible happens, I just step back and watch it from a divine detached place. And knowing that in the past everything I judged as wrong or bad turned out to be great, 
I just ask for my gift right now in the present situation, hmm. and it shows up. <laughs> well, I, I have to say, Dorothy was thankfully around uh, this week when I was verbally attacked by someone who clearly knew not of what they spoke. Um, and I, I saw you, Dorothy has this thing that she does with her hands every once in a while when she's sending energy. And so I saw you doing that and I thought, oh great, help is on the way. <laughs> because I wanted to, I wanted to set this person straight. I wanted to let them know who I was and who, what they were, how wrong they were. And that was clearly would not have been the right thing to do. So talk, talk me through this now that I'm thinking about it again, Dorothy. Remind me how good it was that I turned the other cheek, so to speak. Well, you know, we have to pick our battles. And it just, you just consider the source. And, and when you know that everything is love and everything is a test, then you could just breathe your way through it. And what I was doing with my hands was just sending you lots of truth and lots of love and reminding you telepathically of who you really are and so you rose to your higher self and just let this person do what they needed to do in other words you elegantly passed a test hmm. well hopefully I passed and don't have to experience it again but I will have to say what I was getting whether that was coming partly from you and the energy you were sending or I was connecting or I was desperately looking for answers what I was getting was that um, this person was where they were and I was no longer in that place uh, because there was a time when I was there. And uh, just like we started the show off with reading a letter from somebody saying, I wasn't able to hear you four years ago or what have you, this person would not have been able to hear me and would uh, the situation would have just escalated uh, and gotten more difficult. And so it, it was my ego who wanted to say, no, you're wrong. But thanks to you and thanks to my understandings and the learnings that we're doing and the changes that we're doing, um, uh, I was able to put my ego down and say, no, this person is a good person. It's just he's, he's not where, where I am. And thank you for showing me where, where I am now. Well, you're in a wonderful place. And... Uh it gets better every day, doesn't it? It does, actually. And thank you for the State of the Universe address and the State of the Filippo address. I appreciate that, okay. Dorothy. <laughs> well, friends, that's our show for today. It, it all seems to go by so quickly every week. Uh, we'd like to thank, once again, Michael Pattinson for being on our show and invite you to learn more about him by going to our show archives on our website and clicking on the respective links for more information. We look forward to being together with you again next week with our guest, Julian Michael, who is a world-renowned numerologist, and it's always exciting when Michael's around. I'm sure it'll be a show not to be missed. Remember, you can keep the conversation going during the week, even though we don't have a show, uh, by listening to our archive shows or by visiting us and writing us on our website at www.lifechangeswithfilippo.com. Uh, my name is spelled F-I-L-I-P-P-O. And connect with us on our Life Changes with Filippo Facebook fan page or, for that matter, any of our personal fan book pages or Facebook pages. Today's show has been made possible in part by our sponsors, Ion Ways Water Systems, Change Your Water, Change Your Life, and Love and Miracles. To learn more about them, visit our sponsor page on our website and click on their links. I am Filippo Voltaggio, and it has been a pleasure being of service by hosting Life Changes with Filippo today. I'm kind of getting emotional, John. <laughs> I, along with our segment hosts, Dorothy Lee and Stacey Hess, our show producers, Mark Skelton, John Snow, and Mark Lejeur, and Seth, our engineer, thank you for joining us and being a part of the show and being a part of the change we all wish to see in the world. Ciao. You have been listening to Life Changes with Filippo. 
Join us here every Monday night at 9 p.m. Pacific Standard Time and visit us on the web at lifechangeswithfilippo.com. That's Filippo, F-I-L-I-P-P-O.com. And follow our community on Facebook at Life Changes with Filippo. Or just drop by Filippo's house anytime you feel inspired. <laughs> oh, is that not okay? No, that's not in the that's, script. That's why, we, that's why we recorded. I'm sorry. But please join us here next week as we graciously embrace the only constant, life changes. <laughs>